Well, good morning, church. I want to welcome all of you who are joining us in person. Those of you who are online, welcome. Happy Easter to you. The Lord is risen. You know, one of the things I love about South Sub Church, if you were here Friday night, this platform was filled with a 32-piece orchestra and 55-voice choir, maybe more, I'm not really sure, violins, cellos, violas, see, I'm trying to be one with the viola players there. This, this room was filled with some good old-fashioned church music, and when I say old-fashioned, I mean like 800 years old. And this room was packed, packed with people in our community as they came to, to observe Good Friday. And, and as we listened to that cello, those cellos and, and those violas lift us in, in, in worship, it was powerful. But one of the things I love too is today we've got cello and viola rocking it out. We, we try to do everything that we do as well as we can. Uh, second thing I want to say, the Brotherhood Retreat, they have a really terrible speaker for this year, and um, it, it's me, by the way, and uh, on the 12 Disciples, gentlemen, brothers in Christ, I really, really encourage you to come. Please, please, please come. You're going to be, you're going to be really intrigued as we walk through the Disciples and see what Jesus did with those, uh, those 12 people and as he, uh, as he sought to prepare them to be evangelists. Also this morning, you didn't, I didn't tell you I was going to come down, did I? Also this morning, we have our regional minister of the Christian Church in the Central Rocky Mountain region, Reverend Joanne Bell Haynes. Let's give her a welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I know you probably have a full day, but I'm glad you started here. Me too. Amen. God bless you. I hope after the service you'll greet... Uh, uh, Reverend Joanne, and, and share with her how much you love your pastors. So, anyway, <laughs> we're finishing up our series today, The End of Me. And don't worry about it. If this is the first time you've heard a message in this series, it's a standalone. It'll be fine. We're looking at the resurrection story from the Gospel of John. So if you have your Bibles, your tablets, your phones, or however you read God's Word, I would encourage you to turn to John uh, chapter 20, uh, beginning in verses 1 and going through verse 18. Now, I'm going to do something a little bit different today. This is such a long text um, that uh, I'm going to actually split it up. So keep your Bibles near you, and uh, uh, we'll reference it as we go through this message. But John chapter 20 beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, I, I know you're expecting me to continue I will in just a little bit, but do know that this is God's holy and perfect word. Throughout the season of Lent, we've been looking at the theme, The End of Me. It's based on the book by the same title by Kyle Ademan, who is the teaching pastor at Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, looking at the, did I say that like a Kentuckian? I did, didn't I? It just slipped right out, didn't it? Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, uh, that's, don't say that if you go there. We've been looking at the Sermon on the Mountain, Matthew chapter 5 through 7, specifically at the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Think, the, the, these are things that we've been looking at through this series that when we hear them, we say, that doesn't make sense. That's not how the world works. When Jesus comes and talks to us, when he comes and teaches us his way, God's way, uh, it turns the whole thing, the whole world upside down. As a matter of fact, when we read these Beatitudes, if we read them and we weren't in the context of, of the faith or the context of Scripture, these would be things that would normally provoke anxiety in us. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who mourn. 
When I was a young pastor just out of seminary, only a few years, the first church I served after I was ordained was a little neighborhood church. About once a month in that congregation, we would offer a healing portion of the service. The way it would work, we'd have our regular worship service, and near the end of the service, almost the very last thing, we would uh, we'd sing a song, and folks who wanted to be healed would come forward. And the elders and I would be up there waiting for them, and the elders would lay hands on them, and I would anoint them with oil, and we would pray for them. This is all very biblical. It comes from James chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, just in case you don't believe me. There it is. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed any sins, he will be forgiven. Lots of times we don't read that sentence. We like to skip over that sentence. Well, on that one particular Sunday, there was a lady who came to our church. She had been invited to come to the church by a friend who attended that congregation. By the way, that's how folks come to church, by the way. They're invited by you. Well, when she came forward as the congregation was singing, I met her and took her hand and gave her that look, you know. You know, it's that question, like, Tell me what, what we can do. What, what are we praying for? And here's what she said. I'll never forget these words. She said, I'm going to die. I have a brain tumor that has wrapped itself around my brain stem, and it's growing into my brain with its tentacles. I just returned from Vanderbilt Cancer Center in Nashville, Tennessee. They said that the MRI is conclusive. I'm going to die. Well, as we talked, I mean, a young punk kid preacher doesn't know what to say. Well, what are we going to do next? Is that not the stupidest question anybody could ask? She told me that they had scheduled her for a biopsy the following week just to make absolute sure, but they knew that there was no hope. But because of the complexity of how the tumor had wrapped itself around the brainstem, they needed to take another MRI as they prepared to take that biopsy. It was really heartbreaking to hear the story. There was a resignation in her voice. And although she stood before me. She was able to stand. She was able to talk. She seemed strong. She was a woman, if you just looked at her, would never have known that anything was wrong, but she was a walking dead woman. She knew it, and now I knew it. Well, as the song stopped, I invited the congregation to be seated, and although her story was significantly more hopeless than the other stories that we had heard when folks came up for healing. We did what we were supposed to do. We gathered around her. I took some oil, anointed her on her head. The elders laid hands on her, and we offered this prayer. I anoint you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, that your sins be forgiven, your body made whole, you may serve Christ and his church. Amen. Well, she looked at me <laughs> with, with those eyes that said, uh, is that it? And I told her, sure, yeah, yeah th- th- thank you for coming forward. You can be seated now. And she got up, and she politely thanked me and left, but I could tell she was pretty disappointed. I mean, we all have seen healings, right? I mean, we've seen them on TV. I mean, there's got to be pastors reaching up to heaven and pulling the healing down from heaven and throwing it on the person who's sick. Sometimes we'll lay prayer cloths on them. We'll speak in tongues. We won't speak in tongues, Reverend Joanne. But sometimes some folks will speak in tongues. The band will be playing. Harry be driving that rhythm on the drum set. The congregation bursting into song. I could tell that surely this rote prayer that I said over her, those quiet hands of the elders and some oil that was purchased at the Christian bookstore, wasn't going to do it. Didn't that preacher hear me? I'm going to die. This is all he could do? 
Would what he had done be enough to defeat the aggressive tumor that was consuming her brain and would ultimately consume her life? You know, brothers and sisters, the one thing that we all share in common, every single one of us, rich, poor, male, female, whatever ethnicity we are, the one thing that we all share in common is someday we're going to die, every single one of us, if the Lord tarries. We're really not all that different than the lady who came to be healed of the brain tumor. We just don't know that our condition is terminal. Now, you and I may have a few more years to live, but ultimately, death will catch us, and we will, in our bodies, lose. You know, it started all the way back in Genesis. God told Adam and Eve, Verse 16, and the Lord commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now there's a wonderful sermon series in there because what God said would happen, God's mercy overwhelmed the law, and Adam and Eve did not die on that day. But you and I, we don't really like to talk about death, do we? We even have words that mitigate the intensity of that word dead or death. What is it? What are some of the words we use? Pass, pass away. What else? That's all you got? (laughs) Oh, my lands. We need to take you all to Appalachia. (laughs) Oh, there's gone on. They've entered into the presence of God. If you're in the secular culture, what is it? They might have kicked the bucket they crossed over or they went to the light. We will think of every possible phrase that there is to avoid saying the word dead. In our church calendar, we observe the death of Christ here at this church on Monday, Thursday, but then again on Good Friday. But you know, Easter Sunday always draws the larger crowds. I'm not trying to be mean or hateful. It's just the way it is. No one wants to come out and celebrate the death of Christ, unless, of course, Dr. Dameron's leading the choir and an orchestra and the requiem. But over the years in my ministry, I have just come to understand that we are people who seem to want to focus on life and not death, and I understand that. I've been with people who have died. Hundreds, probably, of people who have died. There's a certain holiness to those moments, by the way. I mean, in many ways, as I have been with those people, it has helped remind me of what is most important in the human experience. You know what? I've never been with somebody who's dying in a hospice that has said, Pastor, could you check the stock market one more time for me? It's not happened. I've only had one say, Pastor, make sure my wife takes care of my truck. (laughs) Oh, wait a minute. That's my words I'm going to say. Let's just forget about that. No. (laughs) What do people say? What do people want? They want to be surrounded by their family, don't they? They want to be with the people that they love and that love them. They want a prayer. Sometimes they want time to confess to tell me something that's been on their heart and on their conscience for decades. And before they meet God, they need it to get it out, knowing I wouldn't tell anybody. I would say that in every situation, folks who are about to close their eyes in death are focused on the important things in life, the things that you and I too often forget about. Isn't it terrible that death has to be what comes to show us what's important? And in every situation, I have said something along these lines, because I believe it. Soon, my brother, soon, my sister, you're going to close your eyes here, and when you open them again, you're going to see the face of Jesus. You're going to hear his voice. You're going to feel his embrace. Can y'all think about what it's like to be hugged by Jesus? Man, that's beautiful. You see, I believe this. Why do I believe it? Because Jesus died for 
me. And he rose again for me and you. All of my sins, all of my rebellion, all of my brokenness, Jesus took it and held it in his arms. He received the punishment that was mine. And the cross is a reminder of the severity of my selfishness, my greed, my, 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 my the world revolves around me syndrome. The end of me. The end of me? The end of me. Because I'm forgiven. That in Christ's love for me, the gift of grace and mercy through faith that I have received, that now I'm a child of God. I am a beloved child of God. You're a beloved child of God. You are God's daughter. You are beloved daughter. You are God's son, a son in whom God is well pleased. All because of what Jesus has done. So that lady that we anointed with oil, she traveled back to Nashville that following week, and several days later, she returned home. And the first thing she did when she came back to town is she came to see me. She came in and sat down in my study, and I asked her, again, another really dumb question. So, how you doing? But this time, she was different. She was nervous. She was a little giddy, actually. And she said, they said it is gone. Well, well, what they said to me, Pastor, is it was probably never really there. Mm. <laughs> she said, when I arrived at the hospital, they said that they wanted to do one more MRI to make sure that they didn't do any damage when they took the biopsy. And so when the pictures came back, they said that the area where the tumor was was fuzzy. I don't know if that's a medical term. There might be some physicians in the house to help us with that. And they said they'd have to use another machine, but the other MRI machine wouldn't be ready for several hours. It was 12 hours later before the other MRI machine was clear, and she could be scheduled to yet have this MRI done. And when they did, she said, the tumor was gone. John chapter 20, verse 2. The first preacher, a woman preacher, I just got to tell you that because the regional minister is here today. <laughs> they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they've laid him. Verse 3. So Peter went out with the other disciple, probably John. And they were going toward the tomb. Probably John was what I added, not what was in John. Verse 4, both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. So you know what I asked this lady next after she had just told me the tumor was gone? Did they give you any pictures of the MRI? <laughs> we always want proof, don't we? Even we pastors want proof. Now just so you know, I have no clue whatsoever how to read an MRI. <laughs> I've never even seen an MRI, would not know what to do with an MRI if one was given to me. But guess what? She pulled out some copies. And I guess it was easy enough to see. You could lay the three MRIs there. There was one that was clearly had something there that looked like it shouldn't be there. And the second image was kind of fuzzy. That's the only word I could think of. And then the third image... It was gone. It was like it was someone else's MRI. And as I stood there, looking at these pictures, thanking God I didn't go into medicine, <laughs> she said to me, they said it was a problem with the MRI machine. But the bottom line, 
I don't have cancer, and I'm not going to die. Well, that's partly true, dear sister. You're going to die, just not today. (laughs) Verse 8, John chapter 20. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. Mm. For as yet they did not understand. I'm not sure I understand, and I've been doing it this long. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they've laid him. Are you kidding me? Now, before you get mad at her, you do the same thing. Because the human brains are remarkable, aren't they? I mean, we think we're being rational, and in an effort to be rational, we deny the truth that is right in front of us. The MRI machine must have been malfunctioning. She said the doctor told her afterwards, very quietly. I don't know if the machine was malfunctioning or not. It could just be a miracle. I like that doctor. Someday I hope to meet that doctor. But you know what? I I wasn't really sure if she believed it was a miracle, but maybe that's okay. She was just relieved she didn't have cancer. Verse 14, having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And then Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, I'm sorry, that's just hilarious. If you carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And when the proof is right there in front of us, brothers and sisters, we still can't believe. As a guy that studies this kind of stuff all the time, you know, theology and the like, this is why the Bible says that faith is a gift. God the Holy Spirit gives us faith. I mean, we're so broken down, we can't even see what's plainly in front of us sometimes. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary, that's important, that's the most important verse, Mary, she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher, and then Jesus says our name. Now that's remarkable, brothers and sisters. Has Jesus said your name? I believe he has. Are you ready? I believe with all of my heart that he said your name when he was on the cross. He had you on his mind. And when he opened his eyes and he stepped out of that grave, I believe he had your name on his mind when he, has, when he said, I have beat death for Put your name in that space. Verse 17, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Still hard to believe, though, isn't it? I mean, some of you are going to go home this afternoon or to your family's house. You're going to have ham or whatever it is you have. And you're going to be thinking to yourself, that's a hard story to believe. It has to be a story they made up to prove that the last three years of their lives weren't a waste of time. That, 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 that's that's got to be what it is. That story is a story that that, that the disciples just made up in order to give themselves, uh, you know, uh, uh, fancy cars and, and a nice big house and a life of luxury as a, a religious leader. 
11 of the 12 disciples spent the rest of their lives suffering for that message. 11 of the 12 disciples met their death in the most horrific of ways because they refused to recant their story. And that's only because John wouldn't have the good decency to die when they tried to kill him. According to the Bible, over 500 people saw the resurrected Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 8. Listen, brothers and sisters, I don't worry about the negative posts on social media. I don't worry about how the History Channel tries to re-spin things. What I know, what I know in my life is that lives have been changed because of Jesus Christ. And a world's ethic has been influenced by Jesus. Crazy things like forgive your enemies, turn the other cheek, serve the poor, love one another as I have loved you. A brain tumor healed. Now the thing is, is I never saw that lady again, but that doesn't surprise me. It probably shouldn't surprise you. That happens a lot. Folks come to Christ in a time of crisis, impending divorce, depression, disease, cancer, but then when Christ heals and restores and renews, and we, thinking that death has passed by, fall away. doesn't really matter because Jesus doesn't do the things for us because we deserve it. Jesus does the things for us because that's what Jesus does. Well, this is Easter, brothers and sisters, or I like to call it Resurrection Sunday, and the truth is that today is the day we celebrate that death has been defeated. For even when death comes to lay his hand on me, I will smile And I'll look back at his hooded and shrouded face, and in an instant, I will feel also the embrace of Jesus. Not because of anything that I've done, but because Jesus filled my emptiness. The end of me. I ended, he began, and it is finished. Today is a day that in the midst of battles that you might think have been lost, Jesus declares that the war has been won. Struggling with it still? That's okay. Just relax. The Holy Spirit is persistent. And the Spirit will continue to speak comfort into your heart. And someday, hopefully today, but if not, someday, you'll finally be emptied and Jesus will fill you. Would the elders join me at the table?